In this talk, I'd like to discuss two ever-present challenges in life detection. Where to look, in this case on a planet's surface or subsurface or atmosphere, and what to look for. <clears throat> and that would be recognizing potential biosignatures in unfamiliar terrain. And throughout this talk, I'd like to use examples from the Mars Exploration Program, which can be quite illustrative. To start with, Mars rover missions are necessarily multidisciplinary in nature, and that, of course, is to optimize the amount of science return against the cost. Uh, an important point is that extraordinary success of the follow the water theme, uh, which is, was addressed right shortly after the year 2000 or so, uh, really transformed Mars science. And that is because the focus on habitability assessments has made missions more interdisciplinary. So the major disciplines are geology, astrobiology, and atmospheric science that have really come together more completely. If you look here under geologic environments, you can see that many of the environments of interest, sedimentary systems, hydrothermal, deep subsurface, groundwater, summarily igneous, many of those are candidate habitable environments. And therefore, a key aspect here is not only to characterize geologic processes, but to assess past habitability in these environments. And this is really important for astrobiology because assessments of geologic processes in paleoclimate provide an essential context for characterizing the environment and even recognizing potential biosignatures. So how do we sort of determine what the requirements for habitability are? Well, you start with the basic concept of life's attributes. What are, what's it, what are fundamental aspects of life that need to happen in order for it to persist? And of course, this then translates to the attributes for, uh, that define the requirements for habitable environments. First of all, we have information storage and replication a complex suite of components that collectively constitute what we call an automaton. Uh, uh, it was conceptualized by von Neumann in the early uh, 20th century. And this is the machinery necessary for cell replication. So you need that. And this involves some pretty complicated molecules to be functional. Secondly, of course, you need a source of energy. And harvesting free energy help, enables metabolism and to maintain that information content in your automaton. Uh, third, you need organic biosynthesis, of course, uh, and it needs nutrient sources in order to make the stuff of life. And a key point also is that you need kinetically enhanced reactions uh, that facilitate the self-regulation of this entire system and also to uh, outcompete abiotic uh, reactions for that source of energy that you want. But the key point with all this is that some really key molecules are chemically rather fragile, and they also depend on mutual non-covalent interactions with each other, and all these place constraints on the environment. So let's be a little more uh, explicit about then the requirements to sustain life. Uh, this is a figure that Tori Holler came up with some time ago. And the key four elements or four aspects that are identified here are the raw materials, the energy source, the solvent, and the clement conditions that can s support life. Uh, and the key thing is that all of these have to be present simultaneously to create what we call a habitable environment, hence that H that's in the middle of the diagram. Now, if you start to investigate these things, you can, uh, it allows quantitative assessments and comparisons of environments to be made. And since the follow the water theme was so successful in finding so many places on Mars where water was once present, how do you pick between them to determine which ones are the most promising? Well, one key approach is to quantify the abundances and the constraints upon these resources. So, for example, in the case of raw materials, it's not just their abundances, but it's their solubility, their availability for organisms. So I'm thinking of iron as an element in particular. Uh, in terms of energy, you have to have a supply that exceeds what the demand of the, is placed on the organism and just to survive. So this is a supply-demand ratio is really important. 
under with solvent it's not just the abundance of water but it's chemical activity if it's so salty that life can't use it <clears throat> then it's a constraint on habitability and then finally of course the climate conditions two key points that point out here is that duration of those conditions matters and secondly uh, if you have extremes in temperature pH or salinity this ex imposes energy costs on the organism and that's a good example of how these factors these four areas interact with each other that, and collectively determine the suitability and the habitability of an environment uh, so these are all things that um, it, it can be pursued to help us evaluate uh, some sites against others and make the optimal choice. Uh, this is not just an idle numerical exercise. This is actually um, born some fruit from the Curiosity rover mission, uh, which basically identified an ancient persisted stratified lake in Gale Crater Mars. It's not there now, but it was there billions of years ago. <clears throat> the observations of, of multiple layers of sedimentary rocks that were formed underwater indicates the former presence of a persistent water body. The mineralogy and other chemical measurements indicated that the pH of that water was pretty moderate, that the salinity was relatively low, and that the key, key elements for life were available. And not only that, as indicated by this, this oxidant reductant uh, gradient in the water column, there were even chemical energy sources available, and of course, potentially sunlight as well. So this was an ancient habitable environment. Not to say it was inhabited, but it was habitable. So that's a nice demonstration of this multi-dimensional approach to assessing habitability. So now let's turn our attention to biosignatures. Uh, this is a definition that has been in use now for uh, quite a while in the astrobiology program and also in the Mars exploration program. And that is a biosignature consists of objects, substances, patterns, or activities, or ensembles of these features whose origin requires a biological agent. Um, so uh, that's uh, basically the definition, but then we have to acknowledge the challenges. Uh, in the actual missions, we have the challenge of interpreting something that's not a biosignature, and that would be called a false positive if we thought it was evidence of life. And then you have the problem of false negatives, and that is the biosignature was there, but you just did not detect it for whatever reason. So these are important challenges. Um, and as accor accordingly, uh, the term potential biosignatures uh, has been has come into common use. And again, the definition is similar with a key difference. A potential biosignature consists of objects, substances, patterns, or activities, or ensembles of these features that potentially provide evidence of past or present life. So the key thing here is potentially provide evidence. It doesn't really mean that you have found it. Um, the key point here is that the usefulness of a potential biosignature is determined not only by the probability that life produced it, but also by the improbability that non-biological processes produced it. And again, with that, the key challenges of false positives and false negatives. So let's explore a little bit further uh, these potential biosignatures in these categories of objects, substances, patterns, and activity. And with that, we go to the next slide where we have an illustration of the known biosignature categories. This figure came from the Mars exploration study called, again, the IMO study uh, addressing sample return. We have the well-known organic matter as biosignatures. And of course, these are substances. And if you look at assemblages of these molecules, you have the potential to discern interesting patterns. The traditional ones, the structures and textures like stromatolites and microfossils, objects, which again, if you do population assessments, could give you patterns. Uh, other kinds of chemistry, inorganic chemistry, uh, again, you could use substances and patterns between them to potentially identify interesting uh, potential indicators of life. Over on the right side, uh, certain minerals could be diagnostic. Uh, and again, when you think about the uh, magnetite crystals formed in certain bacteria, uh, they have certain diagnostic features that could be uh, useful. And then, of course, activities, obviously, uh, you, know, the, you know, if you actually detect 
active things happening uh, as the life uh, detection experiments in Viking attempted to do that course could be another type of biosignature. And then finally, stable isotopes. And that is that ratios of stable isotopes of the biologically important elements could, uh, by virtue of the patterns you see between different compounds or substances, could in itself constitute a biosignature. The key point here is that coordinated analyses of multiple features in a category, as well as multiple categories of potential biosignatures, greatly strengthen the interpretations of their origins and significance. And that's why all, all these categories are listed in plural form in the uh, uh, biosignature definition, because you probably need assemblages of observations of features in order to become more demonstrative of life. So biosignatures of past life. Again, these, this is um, a list and part of a study that was done by IMOS, this International Mars Sample Return Objectives and Samples Team. Key question being, are there detectable biosignatures in any of the returned samples? And basically, you want to assay for the presence of biosignatures of past life at sites that hosted habitable environments and could have preserved any biosignatures. Uh, and so basically, this IMO study uh, assessed strategies for in situ investigations and for the selection of return samples uh, they, they, to assess preservation of potential biosignatures and, of course, to investigate the range of potential biosignatures types, while also simultaneously, as part of the mission, characterizing key geologic processes. So I'd like briefly to go through each of these things indicated in the in the pink box and uh, just say a few more words about them. So the first one is preservation and degradation. Uh, that is to search for the most favorable conditions for preservation. And the key game here is you have preservers and degraders with respect to biosignatures. The preservers could be relatively rapid burial into rocks. You know, in other words, you get them out of harm's way as quickly as you can. Secondly, you have certain phases, which on Earth has been have been very not good for preserving biosignatures. Silica, carbohydrates, carbohydrates, carbonates, shales, and evaporites. Uh, reducing conditions are favorable. And then, of course, low temperatures and low pressures after, after burial. The bad guys are the oxidation, react, radiation, and metamorphism processes. And these are uh, all potentially capable of destroying your biosignature. And so we basically need to perform measurements to characterize the, the good guys, the preservers that they're there, and also uh, to identify any evidence of post-depositional processes, including cosmic radiation, that might uh, have degrade these. All part of the assessment of finding the best places to look for biosignatures. So let's just briefly go through some of these. Um, the key thing with organic molecules and deposits is to look for features arising from biosynthetic pathways ways and that might be indicators of key biological functions and for that we're basically in the game of interpreting molecular structures uh, structures of individual molecules relative abundances of molecules molecular weight distributions and abundance of related species that contain these key biogenic elements so the measurement game is basically to measure molecules and characterize their structures but also uh, to identify spatial relationships between the organic matter and associated minerals, because minerals could be another type of biosignature, potential biosignature, and then ultimately between the organics and the history of the host rock. So these are all aspects of just looking for organic molecules as potential biosignatures. Stable isotope ratio patterns are sort of related. Uh, patterns of isotopic discrimination arising from enzymatic catalysis and metabolic pathways could in themselves well, in concert with organics and other things, be diagnostic of life. And the key aspect here, for example, would be to look for patterns of isotope values uh, between substances that are linked by networks of chemical reaction pathways. So basically, uh, can we see patterns between organic molecules in their isotopes that might suggest some kind of a biosynthetic network? And of course, for that, we want to look at patterns, isotopic patterns within individual organic molecules, uh, between individual organic molecules, between classes of organic compounds, and between oxidized and reduced compounds uh, that, again, contain these biologically important elements. Thank <laughs> you. 
And so basically that dictates what the measurements are uh, to, to try to characterize these things. And that basically is what we're interested in with the stable isotopes. Minerals, of course, which I've mentioned already, uh, we're interested in chemical compositions, crystal structures and forms, orientations, whatever. An interesting point pointed out by Bob Hazen is that biochemical processes may be responsible directly or indirectly for most of Earth's known mineral species. Uh, it would be very interesting to see to the extent to which you know Mars would address the potential of that, but that's why we got to go make the measurements. And so the measurements would be to characterize minerals that on Earth are compositionally or morphologically associated with biological activity or catalytic activity. And that would, again, be preservers like the carbonates, the sulfur minerals, and the phosphates and phyllosilicates, but now also transition metal oxides. Uh, they might have characteristic signatures, like those little magnetite crystals I mentioned. Map spatial relationship between minerals and formerly habitable environments and document course relationships between that and the histories of the source rocks. So let's now go to structures and textures. In a way, these are the original first recognized biosignatures in the rock record. And they involve various aspects of rock, rock textures and also body fossils, biofilms, bioherms and biofabrics, and even trace fossils. The key point here is that these are visual observations and that need to be conducted all the way from submicron scale, like for cells, all the way up to potentially hundreds of meters if we're talking about reef type communities as we see in some places on the earth. So uh, there's a range of just visual observations that would be uh, important for this one. Chemical features is sort of the additional category, uh, and this is one that really embodies a lot of the uh, inorganic minerals, inorganic elements, elemental abundance patterns, patterns elevated organic concentrations, uh, redox boundaries, which are, could be places where organisms could derive energy, and of course then we can like to conduct measurements of abundances and these redox patterns associated with that. So with that, let's go to, again, an, an aspect of the IMO study, and that is to address the question, why return sample studies are important. And I should mention right off the top that uh, the sample return option is a potential option for most in situ mission destinations. So the fact that you can send something there to the surface of a planet indicates it's not totally out of the question that you could bring the samples back to the Earth. So this is an option uh, for in situ missions. Uh, and Mars sample return, of course, is uh, the most shining and, and clear example of this because there is an imperative to actually identify and return samples to Earth within the next decade. So during the mission, the in situ mission, you're exploring for the most promising sites and you're conducting in situ measurements to select the most promising samples. And then when you return the samples, to Earth-based laboratories, you have what we call, you enable what we call observation-guided sample preparation. And that is when you see the samples, what you see actually guides how you would prepare them. Do you do thin sections? Do you certain chemical separations? And these, of course, greatly increase your diagnostic power. We would love to be able to do thin sections and observe them in a remote mission to Mars, but that doesn't seem like that's possible in the near future. And then the real punchline here is that you have laboratory consortia that can exchange samples to interrogate these potential biosignatures. And these, of course, are state-of-the-art laboratories that actually, in which you can actually develop a new methodology based on your observations of these samples, new technology. Um, and then, of course, the punchline is you can archive some of these samples and save them for even better uh, technologies in the future. I'd like to then just spend a few comments on uh, the question of is there evidence of extant Martian life in any of the return samples, actually living organisms? That is to assess the possibility that any life forms detected are still alive or were recently alive. I think, again, without getting into the detail in the purple box too much, I think the key point here is that um, you would like to maybe to look for organic molecules, which by virtue of their uh, chemical sensitivity must have been of recent origin, which pretty much means that there must have been life somewhere recently, even if it's not right where you are taking the sample. And secondly, of course, the standard stuff like what Viking attempted, assessing metabolic activity, the potential for reproduction and all of that. 
But I shouldn't leave this uh, topic without, of course, raising the specter of contamination. There has to be an incredibly rigorous effort to define and constrain uh, and contain contamination. Uh, that's really a key challenge in this topic of looking for extant life. And so just like with the past life and the, and the other types of biosignatures, we still have very similar uh, benefits we can list for why return sample studies are important. Uh, you can imagine trying to characterize maybe small populations of organisms requires instruments and protocols that are very large and complex. Again, uh, it's special sample handling, especially to avoid contamination. And then an investigation pathway that's discovery dependent. We really don't know what form life might take, whether, and whether it would be alive or even have the ability to grow. And so these questions uh, pose a guide as to how we might design experiments we hadn't even thought of yet. And that's an aspect, of course, of, of uh, sample return missions. And so with that, I'd just like to leave you with uh, some critical open questions. And these questions, of course, apply to all efforts in life detection uh, beyond the Earth. And, uh, you know, what is the evidence for that and how confident are we in the results? You know, does life on Earth or elsewhere share a common ancestor? What are the universal requirements of life? That second example could really help with that. And does life elsewhere perform the processes that we presume are necessary for all life? I mean, when I started with this basic attributes of life slide, uh, that's life as we know it. Uh, can, we could, and we need to test that with a second discovery. And then what are the physiologic and metabology, metabolic strategies for life on other planets? Sort of another way of looking at the same question. And so with that, um, that concludes my talk, and I thank you for your attention.